Hi, I'm Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. I'm glad you've joined us for a series of studies that I've titled Calvin's Terrible Tulip. What we're going to be doing is taking a look at a little known but very dangerous set of doctrines that have made great inroads into the church. And what we're going to do is be using as a guide a workbook by Gene Taylor called Calvinism Analyzed and Answered. And you can download it at this web address. In fact, there are many other booklets and workbooks that you can download for free at that web address as well. So download what you'd like. So the question that we should start with, I guess, is who is Calvin and what is Calvinism? If you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, there's a little boy named Calvin that I like, and he's got his favorite stuffed animal that he gets into mischief with, well, that would be the wrong Calvin. <laughs> the Calvin I'm thinking about is someone who has established, codified, and pushed a set of doctrines that is so dangerous because it's made great inroads into the church. It permeates the set of doctrines does all corners of the religious world. It's everywhere and it permeates all through especially many major denominations. Calvinism is basic to nearly every question that you'll encounter as you seek to show someone the truth of the gospel, maybe the very basics of how to be saved and how to maintain salvation you'll find that Calvinism is present in a lot of those discussions even if they don't know that they believe in Calvinism. For instance, Calvinism is present when someone claims that faith is only from God, that it comes as a gift of God. Calvinism is present when someone affirms that he's been saved by faith only. And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Calvinism is present when someone embraces certain teachings on the direct operation of the Holy Spirit, uh, especially as it relates to the conviction and the conversion of the sinner. Calvinism is present when someone says that you can be saved so as never to lose your salvation. You cannot become lost once you are saved. Calvinism is also prevalent in many cults, even those that claim to be Christian. Uh, for instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they embrace the doctrine of inherited sin, one of the foundational doctrines of Calvinism. Calvinism, as I said before, has made inroads into the church. It's, it's, it's a threat and a great danger. It used to be that, that preachers would, would preach frequently on the dangers of Calvinism. They would preach thoroughly about uh, whether or not this set of doctrines aligns itself or opposes itself to the Word of God. But there's not all that much teaching on Calvinism anymore. And because of that, uh, certain church members may hear something that doesn't sound quite right to them. Maybe they think it's wrong because mom or dad says it's wrong or because the preacher said it was wrong, but they can't quite put their finger on how or why it's wrong. Well, we want to study Calvinism more in depth. We want to know whether or not this set of doctrines that so permeates so-called Christendom, as I said before, either aligns itself or opposes itself with the Word of God. In today's lesson, we're just going to develop the historical background of Calvinism. And then in later lessons, we'll develop each tenet of Calvinism and compare those tenets to the standard of plain Bible teaching. First, we should realize before we even get to this fellow named Calvin that I've been talking about, uh, Calvinism itself predates Calvin. Uh, the fundamental tenet of Calvinism, total depravity was not original to Calvin himself. Years ago, a Catholic philosopher named Augustine taught it in the 5th century AD, more than a thousand years before Calvin was even born. And some of the things that Augustine had taught persisted 
and took hold. Martin Luther, the so-called great reformer uh, of the 15th century, 15th and 16th centuries, he was born in Germany. And he entered a monastery at the age of 22, a couple years later became a priest, and throughout his priesthood, he began to see things in Roman Catholicism that pricked him. He started to see things in Roman Catholicism that he believed uh, were against what God's Word taught. They stood opposed to what he believed uh, the truth of the Bible was, was all about. And of course, he's famous for uh, supposedly tacking onto a, a church door his 95 theses. Many of those so-called theses uh, codify his greatest objections to Catholicism. They were the selling of indulgences, the idea that you could, with money or property, somehow buy forgiveness. And it got to the point where the selling of indulgences became such big business for the Catholic Church that there were so-called or kind of traveling salesmen who would go throughout the countryside and, and sell these indulgences to poor peasants who hadn't even committed a sin yet, or, or, or they could buy an indulgence for a sin that they had yet to commit. Another thing that needled Luther was the so-called authority of the Pope, his infallibility, the, the teaching that anything that the Pope said goes simply because he proclaimed himself to be the so-called vicar of Christ on earth. Another problem he had with Catholicism was the doctrine of transubstantiation, that in the observance of the Lord's Supper, the emblems of that supper, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, somehow mystically and really are transformed into the actual body and blood of Christ. Well, you can imagine that some of these things didn't sit well with the Catholic hierarchy, and at some point he was, uh, after some persecution, he was excommunic excommunicated from the church, but he continued to, to teach these things, and he became a very big influence on, on those who sought to change what they thought was wrong in their religion. Now, it's fair to say that Martin Luther didn't hate the Catholic Church. He didn't want to bring it down. What he wanted to do was change it. He wanted to reform it, and that's why he's called the Reformer. But the greatest error in Martin Luther's teachings was the idea of justification by faith only. This doctrine teaches that men are saved by faith at the point of belief in Christ without any further acts of obedience. And it may be one reason why he so disliked the little book of James that talks so much about what we as Christians ought to be doing, the works that accompany our faith. This doctrine, justification by faith only, is one of the basic tenets of Calvinism. So let's talk about Calvin. John Calvin was born in France in 1509, and he began to study the classics in Paris at the age of 14. And because of his skill at disputation, his father sent him to study law at the University of Orleans in 1528 and later on in another place called Burgess. After his father's death in 1531, he returned to Paris to study the classics and Hebrew. And it was at this time that he became interested in the principles of the Reformation that were so sweeping so many countries. And after experiencing what he later termed a sudden conversion, somewhere between 1529 and 1534, he began preaching the Reformation doctrines in, in, in Paris. But of course, the Catholic Church still had a very strong hold on not only religion, but also on governments. And to avoid persecution, he traveled from place to place, and finally he, he settled in Switzerland. It was in Basel, Switzerland, in 1536, that he completed his first version of his Institutes of the Christian Religion. The Institutes of the Christian Religion were supposed to be a brief manual that stated that, 
the doctrines of the Protestants, but in reality, it contained a complete outline of Calvin's system of theology. And this was based on work that he had done and on the principle that he believed that scriptures were the sole truth, the sole source of truth in religion. And as time went by, he enlarged and revised this book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, at least a couple of more times in his, in his lifetime. At the request of religious reformer Guillaume Farrell, he went back to Geneva, Switzerland, and he acquired quite a large following. He was very popular, and so popular, in fact, that he was elected city preacher by the, pre by the city magistrates. He compiled a systematic Protestant confession of faith of 21 articles, which the citizens were required to profess under oath. He wrote the first Geneva Catechism in 1536 for use in religious instruction, and the reforms that he advocated were so extreme that he alienated many of the people who had been following him, and not only that, but he provoked very strong political opposition to the things that he taught. So strong were, was the opposition that he was exiled at one point from Geneva in 1538 and went back to France where he became a preacher and a professor of theology. But he was persuaded to return to Geneva, Switzerland. And upon his return, because of his popularity, he revised the laws of the city. He organized a theocratic form of government for the control of both the social and the religious life of Geneva citizens. In fact, his second Geneva Catechism that he wrote in 1542 became the standard of doctrines for most of the Reformed churches in Europe at that time. In fact, so much of what he wrote continues to be the foundation of the so-called Reformed churches throughout the world. But his rigid dogmatism and his severe discipline of those who opposed him led to even more controversies, not only with the Roman Catholic Church, but also with other religious form reformers of the time. He had a falling out. He had some differences with, with Martin Luther about the nature of the Lord's Supper that were so strong that they resulted in the splitting of the so-called evangelical churches of the time into the Lutheran and the Reformed groups. One of the most acrimonious disputes of this period was with a Spanish theologian, Michael Servetus, on the nature of the Godhead. And through Calvin's influence, Servetus was burned at the stake in 1553. His strictness gave rise to discontent even among his followers in Geneva. So you can see how it had become to be not only popular, but a source of, of acrimony between himself and certainly those who, who opposed it. So as we think about John Calvin and his influence, let's talk about the basis of the things that John Calvin taught. The basis of Calvinism has to do with the sovereignty of God. Concerning the sovereignty of God, it's what is at the bedrock of what he taught. One fellow wrote in his book in, on Calvinism, the one rock upon which Calvinism builds is that of the absolute and unlimited sovereignty of the eternal and self-existent Jehovah. Another fellow, Edmund Palmer, in his book, The Five Points of Calvinism, wrote, these other doctrines are an expression of this one central theme. Thus, if God is absolutely sovereign, the Alpha and Omega, then it follows that salvation depends entirely on Him and not on man. And all the five points of Calvinism that we'll be looking at in this series of studies, they all flow from this basic premise in fact, this basis is set forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith. It was written in the 1640s, 
And it is the doctrinal foundation of the English and American Presbyterian churches. It states, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass. It later states that by the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death are particularly and unchangeably designed. And their number is so certain and so definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. So, what are these tenets of Calvinism? I call them Calvin's terrible tulip, or the fatal flower of a French philosopher, because they have been codified into five separate tenets with the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, each letter standing for a separate tenet or basic fundamental doctrine within Calvinism. So what are they? The T stands for total hereditary depravity, the idea that at birth all men are born in sin. They are born depraved, holy, and totally, they are born in this sinful condition because they inherit it from their parents, who inherit it from their parents, and from their parents all the way back to Adam. The U stands for unconditional election. This is the idea that God, before the foundation of the world, arbitrarily chose to save some people and destroy others, and nothing that you do if you are chosen for salvation or destruction, can be done to change God's sovereign decree. The L stands for limited atonement. The idea behind this is simply this, that Jesus' sacrificial death was only for those whom God had unconditionally chosen to be saved. The I stands for irresistible grace. The idea that an unregenerate person cannot voluntarily believe in God except somehow the Holy Spirit work on him. This individual cannot overcome or resist the power of God working through the Holy Spirit. The grace of God is so strong that once he's chosen, he cannot resist it. The P stands for perseverance of the saints. The idea, we may know it better as once saved, always saved. And, of course, this is the idea that, that man can do nothing to lose his salvation. If God's unconditional election is required to save him and he has it, well, consequently, then one needs to do nothing to remain saved. And one can do nothing to lose that salvation once he has it. If one's salvation depended on himself, on man in any way, then the miraculous work of God in saving him would be utterly overthrown and thus the idea of God's sovereignty in salvation would be undone, at least according to Calvinism. This is a synopsis of Calvinism by at least one of his followers. It goes this way. God is ultimate. Therefore, his will is ultimate and final. This is the sovereignty of God, the the foundational premise to all of Calvinism. It goes on to say that according to his sovereign will, he foreordained all things. He foreordained sin itself. He did this for his own glory. To further enhance his own glory, he predetermined that of sinners, he would save some, the elect, and condemn others. He did this according to his own will so that it has nothing to do with anything men do. This is what we called a before unconditional election. For his elect, God has provided atonement and salvation through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, the limited atonement that we referred to before. The problem is that through Adam's sin, his nature was corrupted, and this nature has been passed down to his descendants, the idea of total hereditary depravity. Having this corrupt nature Men cannot come to the knowledge of God by themselves. Even the elect cannot respond to God, cannot have faith, 
until the Holy Spirit opens their hearts to believe and understand the grace of God, exerted in behalf of His elect and according to His sovereign will, cannot be thwarted. This is the idea of irresistible grace. The elect will be saved. His grace will sustain the elect and will not be removed so that they cannot be, la be lost. Their salvation is sure. The idea behind the perseverance of the saints. Calvinism presents a false chain of reasoning. Instead of supporting the truth of Scripture, it stands opposed to it. And we'll find out why in subsequent lessons. In fact, a further analysis of each tenet will show how far this system of doctrine is from the inspired Word of God. Well, now that we've seen what man says, let's see what God has to say about what man does wrongly with His Word. I'm going to turn my Bible first to 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to begin at verse 14. 2 Peter 3 and in verse 14. The inspired apostle says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men, and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Well, that's what we want to do in this series on Calvinism. We want to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can know what unstable men teach. It's not necessary that we know every error that's out there. What is necessary is that we become so well and intimately acquainted with the truth of God's Word that whenever we hear error, we don't just vaguely point to it as though something sounds wrong. We can point to the accuracy and truth of God's Word and know exactly why error is error. We thank you so much for being with us on this first in a series on Calvin's Terrible Tulip. Thanks for joining us.